So one question I'd like to ask, because uh, it's kind of related to the things that Gavin and I were talking about before around performance, is um, I'm curious whether or not in the community, this is kind of off topic a little bit to the talk, so it's kind of maybe moving into the general discussion environment, but I'm curious whether or not, um, my assumption is, is that the vast majority of calcite stuff is people using for things that are not highly latency sensitive in that, you know, if query planning takes 20 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds or 150 milliseconds or something like that, that it's not the end of the world. Um, uh, and I'm curious whether that's, my assumption is correct, or if there's a lot of people on the, on the line that are using um, for more, what I would call sort of OLTP sensitivity in terms of performance. Um, and so I'm curious if people, anybody who's willing to answer, I'm just share on the, on the, on the chat, like, you know, am I, am I more sort of OLTP like in my use of calcite or more OL um, AP like in my use of, um, of calcite, if people are willing to share. So from, in my situation, I'm almost always focused on the analytical side of things. In my experience was more that we got killed by the innumerable compilation time, generating the Java code and compiling the Java code. Even a query that took no time to plan a point lookup on a single ticket was um, was just taking forever, relatively. And even enabling the compiled code cache didn't help. You know, you can change those constants, but it's that that was really the killer for me. I didn't see too much overhead on planning. I mean, I wasn't doing six to ten table joins usually, but. Yeah. Oh, that, that actually is a really good point, which is, is like, I have historically not used any of the execution side of CalSite, so I don't even think about that, but that, that's good to bring up. I actually think that it may be worthwhile to run a survey in the community, because um, I, I would be interested just in terms of like, so that people know what other people are using is like, you know, how many people are using the execution side of CalSite? How many people are only using the planning? How many people are using the SQL parsing? Um, uh, and then, and then OLAP versus um, OLTP and whatnot. Yeah, what I was gonna say is that, like, uh, I think that most people, uh, at least uh, in the beginning, will use uh, enumerable operators, which yeah come with some uh, problems. But when it goes to, I mean, it can be used uh, in the beginning for prototyping. But I guess, yes, at some point you hit uh, one way or the other some obstacles and then you implement your own operators and stuff like that. So I, I find, I, I would say that it's mostly for uh, getting uh, the project started. And then, uh, yeah, I guess that most end users will not uh, rely on innumerable operators. I know some that they do, but uh, I guess eventually everybody will uh, Either we do a better job uh, improving the operators and the compilation process, et cetera, either the people who have uh, their own system. Yeah, just to be clear, I wasn't talking about the actual implementation of the enumerable operators, but in general, you always want to have enumerable at the root, right? So you have your two enumerable converter. And so just the overhead of generating the Java code to, to run the the enumerable to execute it to call it right uh, yeah i mean uh, people uh, do not i mean there are projects who do not use enumerable or uh, bindable or whatever they build the optimizer from scratch uh, and they don't use it at all for instance uh, yeah i mean and I, I guess every other project like hive link uh, druid uh, or whatever i don't think they use enumerable people can confirm but uh, hive has its own operators and they use their own execution engine and it's nothing related to enumerable, not even at the well, well, I think Justice says something interesting if, if I understood him correctly, which is, I think you're saying that even if like, let's say I'm using a, a, a relational adapter where all the SQL is being pushed down into the relational database, that the sort of the, the, the shim that makes it callable actually takes an, an excessive amount of time. Is that what you're saying? If you use the enumerable, yeah, because the enumerable requires the code compilation. Uh, I think what Stamatis is saying is a valid point too, and I hadn't got to that point in the project that I have, have already left. But um, you know, in order to mitigate that, I was required to, uh, I guess, 
discard the result handling stuff where I was reading the innumerable results and that whole convention thing. And I would have to invent my own convention to get the results back from whatever plan I was running to whatever the consumer of the results was. All right, that makes sense. I think that, so one thing that I would note there is, is that there's a lot of other work that's happening. So uh, as some of you may or may not know, I'm working on something called Substrate. I was just trying to be a sort of serialized representation of, of a plan tree. Um, and working in, amongst other things, trying to make it possible to move from calcite trees to substrate trees. Um, and in substrate, uh, so I'm also working with the um, Facebook to Velox team. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the project, it's called B-A-E-L-O-X. Um, uh, they're writing a C++ implementation of like a single node executor. Um, and so hopefully at some point soon, we should be able to use that as an alternative way to run a calcite plan. So. Um, so an option may be that there are other things that will be easy to integrate because they, so both the Arrow community and the Velux community were working on trying to make them consume substrate plans. And if we can get Calcite to convert to substrate plans, um, then hopefully we'll be able to use, try some other execution engines as sort of native, you know, as near native Calcite um, execution engines as, as alternatives to innumerable. So a Velux innumerable and a, and a Arrow innumerable. It's, substrate is insanely cool. Uh, if any of you haven't seen it, definitely check it out. It's one of the neatest ideas I've seen in a long time. <laughs> Gavin's very enthusiastic. It's good. I am. <laughs> uh, have you, uh, Jock? Have you compared uh, with uh, like Presto? Um, you know, I, I've I've heard that uh, Presto uh, latency is. Uh, you know, less than 100 millisecond for uh, TPCH style queries, but I don't know how they perform on more complex joints. Uh, I haven't looked at, I haven't, I haven't really spent much time looking at that. I mean, my hope is, is that like, as we decompose, like my goal with substrate is to decompose these things more so that you can try different versions of things in, in these systems. Um, uh, and that, that we'll be able to start to do those analyses more. Um, right now, the, the Velox stuff is much more on the execution, the data processing side. Um, and so, um, uh, but yeah, my, my hope is, is that like, for those that are interested, one of the things that I was ultimately hoping to do was to start to rewrite some of the algorithms that are in Calcite in, um, a more high, highly optimized form. Um, my experience with, you know, at, at, I worked on, you know, Amon and I worked on drill and, and I worked on Dremio, which both used, uh, Calcite extensively. And my experience was, is that over time, as you got to more and more sophisticated, levels of optimization, you started to have to really decompose things to be able to achieve reasonable performance. Um, and some of those algorithms were, you know, dominant in the overall cost of, of, of time cost of, of optimization. And, uh, and so, yeah, so one of my hopes is, is that as, um, that, that we can potentially use something like Substrate to move back and forth between um, a Java environment and say a native um, algorithm that was highly optimized for a certain thing that was very expensive. So materialized view matching or join reordering, things like that, that that can can dominate portions of a query planning cycle, but um, I haven't yet spent time looking at the um, specific performance of the algorithms like in say Presto. Thanks. Are there other things that people want to bring uh, to the discussion? I mean, uh, we already in the general discussion, so if people want to discuss something else, uh, it's a good time. Hi everyone. Uh, can I ask a question, like a general question about joins? So since we've been uh, talking extensively about joins today, um, are there any um, any projects available uh, that show how to um, uh, to implement a custom join in Calcite? So let's say, for example, I uh, I want to expose a um, uh, sorry to create an. Uh, um, a SQL layer for a, a NoSQL database which implements its own join logic. How would I go about creating a, a, a custom join uh, in Calcite? Uh, are there any, any good examples on how to do that? You can just look at any of the adapters, right? The adapters want to push the joins down over top of the scan. So your scans will have to be external to Calcite, right? So yes, but uh, looking at the adapters, usually it's on um, it, 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 it's on um, 
um, on types of databases that do not implement their own joins. So I haven't actually found any good examples or maybe I, I've overlooked that. What do you mean by custom join? Maybe that, maybe go back to that. Like, what do you mean is, is that it's a, it's a kind of join that has a logical semantic, which is different than normal joins that we do, or is it just that it has a, a, a unique way of expressing how to do a join? Uh, let's say as a, um, uh, as a custom uh, relation, uh, as a custom rel. But it, it but it's like, ignore the sort of implementation but, details. Is it semantically equivalent to say yeah. an inner join? uh yeah yes basically yes okay yeah so i think i think that you know jess's response which is basically um you, you can create like a you know a subclass of the the base class of join um which is you know my special join um and then um build some logic which knows how to convert that to whatever the way is that um you express the join inside that NoSQL system so but the adapters i think i, I agree that adapters uh, like if you look at the adapters for um, SQL, um, mm -hmm. that's probably a, a reasonable place. I don't know which adapters do joins um, inside I the system that are no SQL um, that, that we have adapters for. Do we have adapters? I mean, someone raise their hand. If we have an adapter which does, um, besides the SQL adapter, the, the JDBC adapter, do we have an adapter which does um, uh, push joins pushed into the system? As far as I could see, I haven't found any, but oh yeah, please go. On. Igor said yes. So Igor, where, where, is, where do we have that? Right. Um, it's in our system, so it's not publicly available, unfortunately. But yeah, you, you can <laughs> you can just just <laughs> extend it. your uh, join, uh, like logical join or just join, and do whatever you want. Uh, uh, while preserving the um, like uh, uh, meaning of that operator. So like you, you okay to add some functionality, but uh, do not break the contract. And like that's that's all. So and then if you want to implement it inside the like alternative to what you what we have, you will need to do some implementation, uh, something like similar to what enumerable join does, or similar physical implementation if you want it to be. Uh, executed inside call site, or if you do a push down like GDBC uh, joined us, it's it the same. So uh, either it's like just a notion that the uh, of a join that is going to be pushed down to, to the underlying system that executes that join, or it should be similar to a numerable join uh, when executing inside a call site. Uh, yeah, that would be the former. So the, the join would just be pushed down to the uh... Um, uh, to the data source, to the uh, to the database. So that would be then it's going to be GDBC, very, yes. very similar to G GDBC join and like. Okay, so yeah, if you if you know like off the top of your head of a specific place in calcite or outside calcite where I could take a look, that would be helpful. I, I think he's saying that the JDBC join. If you look at the JDBC join. And then how the, the, let me just see if I can say this right, the rel to SQL converter, not the SQL to rel converter, the rel to SQL converter that takes a JDBC join and converts that into the SQL, in that case, the SQL syntax, but rather than converting from rel to SQL, you'd be converting from rel to your NoSQL thing. Um, so whatever the query syntax. The hard part there isn't really converting it to SQL, but what happens with the JDBC join is that just ignore that it's SQL for the moment and just say that it's implementing by something else. And what really matters is what parts of the tree are like the JDBC parts or your NoSQL system parts. And then you'll have whatever your system's called, let's say it's called system X. You'll have system X to enumerable converter. And then the system X subtree is what you'll need to take and, and push down to your system. So you'll have two tables and a join in your example scenario. Right. Okay. Can you shoot a uh, message to let them can yeah. walk it through you through it? Say it again. Shoot a message to the mailing list and we can walk you through the details on that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. We'll do. I also have a question uh, asking for some direction. So, as I mentioned, I implemented the uh, cal site over. Uh, um, 
I implemented the a part of the OAB identity engine uh, on top of XML files, and I would like to uh, go further and see if I can uh, implement the other important parts. Um, my next goal is to see if I can uh, read the entity definitions from XML files and create a calcite schema from that and uh, map those to the to uh, PostgreSQL database that already uh, it's initialized by OFS instance. So the idea is to export and import data uh, via uh, this uh, my implementation via the site OFS engine implementation. Uh, so the, the idea is to proxy uh, the queries. Um, I would like to do it uh, this way so that uh, the next step would be to see how to integrate um, security uh, inside this uh, CalSite uh, implementation and provide something like uh, row level security uh, where if I'm I I am authenticated uh, uh, as a user. Uh, and I have some uh, some rights. Uh, I will be able to see some uh, data and not see other data. I don't know something like that. I mean, uh, one one thing, one approach is like I guess you can find examples online. But if you want, I guess that the question is how to introduce, uh, let's say, security kind of uh, that's one of the question and the other one is how to proxy uh, if i write a query uh, how to proxy the the stuff that i have the the schema that i built how to proxy to uh, the database and act as a layer uh, as a middleman uh, between that I, I don't know how to explain this better mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, from for the part that I understood, let's say for <laughs> for the security uh, rules, one thing that happens in databases in, in database systems is that they have uh, rewrite rules, or they model uh, security rules via views, so the query gets rewritten based on uh, the permiss on the available per permissions of the user. So if you check like. Uh, for uh, if you search Google for this kind of stuff, rewrite rules using views or access, access restrictions, there are a few things that you'll find. Or another way, I mean, a bit more academic is uh, what is called also like binding uh, views with binding access patterns. And basically, if you have a table, then you kind of model it like a view if you can access this column or this column or this column. And then there are rewrite re rules that can uh, trigger to make it happen or to say that you cannot access this table. So, I mean, yeah, I cannot give many details right here, but uh, if it's search for this kind of stuff, uh, there are techniques in, in the literature that are addressing this part of. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks. I, I will check them out. Uh, and see what I can find. Um, does CalSite support triggers? I don't know. Uh, I mean, support triggers at what level? I mean, I guess at, um, at, at any level because we don't have uh, we don't support them in the parser and we don't have uh, okay. abstractions in the rel node. So it could be something that uh, you could craft. I mean, if you build a plan, a rel node, you could uh, model a trigger, I guess. But the part on when it's going to execute and stuff like that, I don't think we have it. Okay. okay. Others can. Uh, yeah. So uh, the uh, on the security part, I think I have uh, some some pretty good answers and pointers. Uh, on the other part, on how I could uh, read those entity definitions and build a schema, and when a query comes, uh, proxy it to a PostgreSQL or a MySQL database. Um, uh, I would propose G to use GDBC ad adapter. It's like exactly okay. what you want. So like you, you build in your custom schema from that XML files. And then like if those tables are accessible <coughs> through SQL, then GDBC adapter is the right thing to start. Okay, okay. Yeah, thanks.
Okay, so I guess we are a bit over time. I mean, uh, personally, I have some uh, family constraints and I have to jump out. But if uh, if uh, you want to continue discussing, I <laughs> feel free. And uh, okay. I was going to ask one just quick question, um, and I'm going to ask this on the mailing list as well. But um, uh, you know, another project I've worked on having a, a regular uh, uh, video conference sync up. Um, to just talk about things, have people ask questions and whatnot. Um, has that been talked about as something in, in the community done here? Like, you know, every other week we just have a, a regular time that people can jump on Zoom and talk about things or Google Meet or whatever. And would that be interesting to people? I guess two parts. I think it would. Mm, I, I find this a very good idea. I mean, what I was planning, uh, what I wanted with the meetup is like, when the, the first time that they propose it is like to have it more regular. So one presentation so that we motivate also people to come and open discussion for any kind of subject. It, ideally, we could have it one per month, but uh, I don't think it will uh, be very easy. But I, I'm open. We can try. We can try. But uh, yeah, on, on the other ones I'm on, like there, there's no um, there's no topic. Hi, friend. Um, there, there's no particular topic. It's literally just like, you know, people come in the beginning, you say, who wants to talk about what, come up with a list of, of topics. And we talk about those topics that time. And sometimes not maybe, and if it's too frequent, people won't show up. Um, but if it's the right level of frequency, you get a, you know, just like I've done this in arrow. I did it in drill, um, uh, done it in a couple of other communities. Um, and it seems to work really well. So I'll, I'll propose it on the mailing list. Yeah. I, I think that, uh, yeah, once a month or every two months, I think it's reasonable and people will join, but, uh, yeah, let's see. Let's continue on the dev list. In uh, in OFBiz, I noticed they have, uh, or they usually had uh, OFBiz community days uh, every uh, four times a year, I think, something like that. So for a week, uh, it was mostly offline, but I think that uh, something can, can happen also online. So the idea is that, uh, I mean, it wasn't in person, but during a week, they uh, people, people uh, were a bit more active on uh, triaging issues and discussing some, some stuff and trying to fix some, uh, some things in uh, the project. Yeah, so, so let's, let's, start a little let's start a thread about like what kinds of things we can do that, I, like, you know, like whether it's sync ups or, you know, once a, once a quarter or whatever makes sense, I completely agree. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, everyone, for joining. So have to have to leave. See you. Thank, Thank you very much everybody. for organizing. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Have a nice day. Very bye. interesting. Bye bye. Bye bye.